Public health services outside the hospital setting have little or nothing to offer to breastfeeding mothers when they need help with lactation. Nurses and physicians are not officially trained in this area, despite the fact that they are often the first port of call when a mother or a baby needs help with breastfeeding. IABLE, uh, which is short for the Institute for the Advancement of Breastfeeding and Lactation Education, is a nonprofit organization that specializes in providing resource materials and trainings specifically for healthcare professionals. A 16-hour course puts a physician in a much better place to recognize and understand the difficulties that a breastfeeding mother might be facing. My guest today is Dr. Anne Aglash. She is the president of IABLE. She is also a clinical professor with the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a co-founder of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and keep your ears open for our upcoming fundraiser for the breast pump that mimics suckling. And now, enjoy the talk. I am here today with Anne Aglash, and thank you for joining me. Oh, yes. Thank you, Eva. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Great. Um, let's talk about iABLE. iABLE is dedicated to building breastfeeding uh, knowledgeable or breastfeeding friendly medical systems and communities. Um, you define four areas where you provide help for organizations and individuals. Could you please tell us what those four areas are? Yeah, so I guess I have to look at my website to see exactly what I designated as the four areas. But basically, you know, so the way I uh, sort of frame what we're doing is that uh, is that people many people do learn uh, about the importance of breastfeeding, right? Uh, so many people know when they're pregnant what their feeding strategy is going to be. They usually have an opinion or a plan for breastfeeding. And we know that, at least in the United States, I don't know about your country, but in the United States, about 84 to 85% of people will initiate breastfeeding. So people become excited, they plan, they have all of these um, um, all these tools that they've acquired from baby showers, et cetera. Um, and then maybe they get a little education during the prenatal period. It depends on who's caring for them, their hospital system. But they, but they oftentimes start, so we know about 85% are starting breastfeeding in the hospital. And so they're all geared up and ready to go. And then they leave the hospital. And I always make this analogy that it's like, they're being trained for a marathon and they're about to go and do the race and they leave the hospital for their race. And, but then they find out that unlike your typical marathons where people are standing on the sidelines and cheering for them and giving them cups of water and snacks, there's no one there. There's no, they're in a desert and there's no water. And uh, it's, and it's, and it's, a very difficult environment and they and they reach these barriers like these big you know pits in the ground where they can't get out of and they're like how can this be so and they have to climb over these mountains and no one ever told them about all these things and they don't know where can they get help and they feel like they're drowning and they just want to quit and so we feel like we need to like change that terrain right we need to our goal is to not is to fix the desert like let's put in the, the oases Let's find the cheering sections. Let's make sure that every place where lactating individuals and their families go, that they feel welcome, they're being cheered, they're being, they, those, those barriers are gone. You know, those barriers, all, they have the opportunity to breastfeed for as long as they need to, and they have that assistance. And uh, so this is done by, um, you know, providing tools for people who, uh, who support uh, uh, lactating families. So physicians, uh, office nurses, other people who work in medical systems. Um, so even the receptionist, when someone walks into a doctor's office, the receptionist identifying that, oh, this baby's hungry. Like, oh, would you like a, you know, a separate room to lactate? Or you know, feel free to breastfeed here you know, in the office. And not having pictures of bottles as like the norm of infant feeding. Um, it also uh, extends to like having connections between the different places where lactating families go. Like, so in the United States, the connections between like public health, we have public health nurses that go out to the offices and into their homes, but then having that connection with the information that they're sharing with the information that they're getting in the doctor's office. So that if a public health nurse says, gee, you know, your nipples look really sore, 
you should go see your doctor. The doctor doesn't say, well, we don't do that here. Go see lactation. And then the lactation consultant doesn't, can't prescribe anything because they don't have, you know, the, um, it's not within their scope of practice to diagnose and treat, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it's really uh, all about, we're all about forming teams um, of knowledgeable people. So there's many different ways to do that, but we see our role as actually like um, providing the knowledge um, because knowledge in my mind, from, I believe, I believe knowledge is power. And when we start to train people, particularly like in healthcare systems, which is kind of where I live because I'm a doctor and I work for a large healthcare system. Um, when we train people, light bulbs go on and people realize, wow, I have a really great idea for what else we can do to support our prenatal patients. Or like, wow, I have a great idea. Let's do a drop-in clinic. To, I want to share my knowledge. I want to work with these families. And so from knowledge grows initiatives, ideas, ways that we can support people. Because if you don't have the knowledge and you just plan like, oh, let's have a drop-in, let's have a, you know, drop-in sessions for families or let's um, put a sign on the highway, you know, for supporting breastfeeding. Having support with you know, it's one thing to say rah, 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 but then it's the other thing. The other issue is like managing the problems, right? And we know in the United States, the two major problems with main, main reasons why people wean are low perception or real low milk production and pain. Yeah. And those are medical problems. And they have, and so you can't have a, you can't have doctors who are like, yeah, and everyone loves breastfeeding. Of course, why would we not love breastfeeding? We all love babies, but it's one thing to be supportive and it's another to really be able to solve the problem. Exactly. And being knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what exactly is going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. And when, when something is perceived and when something is real medical issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes. These are very important points. And, and I'm, I'm glad you talk about the role of the uh, medical and healthcare professionals in this, because it does feel like that, um, that healthcare really, uh, when the door closes behind the moms in the hospital, they just let, let go of their hands. They let go of their hands. And, and it's an issue because it's a public health matter. Yes. It's a matter of public health, but it doesn't translate as such into the minds of the public because public health let's go of mom's hand after three, four days. Right. And so, so, so the initiative is there or the, the thought is being established that yes, it's a public health matter, but the action doesn't support that statement. And um, yeah, so as so I'm delighted about the work uh, that your organization is doing in this, um, you define a model that is called the breastfeeding friendly outpatient medical system, which is very long sounding, yeah. but also very promising sounding. So yeah. what is there to know about this model? How does this system define support outside the hospital? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in the United States, and I, again, I can only speak for the United States, but in the United States, there are a lot of different ways that communities try to support lactating families, right? So um, there are breastfeeding coalitions that will have like, you know, um, they'll fund things like making sure that employers are supporting lactating, lactating people at work, making sure that they have a pump room and all the things and that they understand that they, you know, what the, what the, what the federal rules are about support. Um, they'll work with churches, they'll work with other religious organizations to support lactation, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot, all this community support, right? But what I believe, and I think that's all good. Absolutely, that's what we need. But in addition, we can't ignore, we can't fear medicalization of breastfeeding um, and think that it's not, it doesn't need to be in the wheelhouse of healthcare because it does, it absolutely does. And one of the main reasons is that when we think about where lactating families and also just say lactating dyads, um, the lactating parent and their child, where do they go? Where are they usually seen? Well, they almost always, nearly always, and I looked at the at the international research on this, nearly everyone goes to take their baby to the doctor. And so that's where this that's where support has to has to be. Not everyone goes to church, not everyone goes to baby cafes or LH League meetings or you know, 
you could have it at not everyone goes to a park. I mean, you can have it like you can have support everywhere, right? But where does everyone go? Where's the common denominator? It's going to be to the doctor's office, um, at least in the United States. I know that this is set up differently in different countries, and so that kind of support has to differ. So when you look at healthcare in the United States, for the most part, the, the majority of primary care physicians, meaning pediatricians, family physicians, internal medicine doctors, they work for large health systems. That we know for sure. That has really increased. Years ago, it used to be that doctors had their own offices and they hung their own shingle and they took care of patients separately. That's more common, I know, in Canada where they have, um, you know, there's one payer and people can just hang a shingle and send the bill to the government. Billing here in the United States is really different and it's much more complicated. And, um, and so we, uh, so, uh, so here it, it's very difficult for physicians to like get insurance contracts and things like that. And so for the ease of not having to deal with the heavy, heavy tier of administration needed to have your own practice here, if you want to take insurance and not just charge cash, you need to be part of the healthcare system. So when you have a healthcare system, you have a lot of things happening, right? You have many different offices. So I should actually step back to say that healthcare systems have grown in size. So we, you have one small group that um, maybe has like five family doctors, you know, four pediatricians, two OBs, you know, a couple of specialists, and they form a healthcare system. And pretty soon they're bought out by um, a hospital. And then that hospital is bought by a larger hospital system. And so you have the little fish being eaten by the bigger and bigger fish. And this is how things have evolved in the United States. So in our, in my community, for example, I work for University of Wisconsin, they bought up a number of offices back in like 2000. So now we have like 30 primary care offices throughout the system. So a patient goes into the office and uh, they're gonna have a different experience to some degree in different offices. And so, so they, there may be one office where there are doctors and nurses who are really knowledgeable about, about breastfeeding and they treat breastfeeding in a very different way versus another office where they give free formula, they have free formula packs sitting on the counter, like, oh, if you need formula, here you go, this is the best formula. They have mm -hmm. bottles. So people have these different experiences and different levels of support from their doctors. So when you're in healthcare system, there are some advantages to the system in that we can take a whole large group of physicians and get them all on board and have these expectations of like, yeah, you're not gonna be giving a few formula. Yeah, you're not gonna have bottles on, on, on your posters. Yes, you are, you are required to take, you know, six hours of training, seven hours of training. Every office is gonna have a lactation consultant. Um, every, um, every radiology, every radiology clinic within that system is, is not going to give advice about pumping and dumping after a CAT scan or an MRI. Every surgeon in that health system is, we're, we're, we're going to make sure that every surgeon knows that, that people can put the babies to the breast right after surgery. They don't need to pump and dump for, for 24 hours after that. So you mm -hmm. have, so it, it's really like, looking at all the touch points in a healthcare system and making sure that everyone's knowledgeable and knows how to support and knows where the answers are if they can't answer those questions. But they're not using their judgment to say, oh, just to be on the safe side, just pump and dump. Like that's so harmful. And I think a lot of times they don't, you know, it's this value of like, well, there's no big, what's a big deal between pumping and, you know, and what's the big deal between pumping and nursing or between breastfeeding and formula, it's still milk, maybe it's still gonna grow, maybe it'll be fine. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not supportive. And we can use the, the dynamics of a healthcare system to really make sure that the user experience and the knowledge and support that they're receiving is, is similar, um, as opposed to a community where you have like 30 separate offices with different management, and some of the doctor's offices are smart to really support breastfeeding so they get more patients. <laughs> so that's the competitive model, right? Um, which is, right. does happen in some communities too. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by support in these large healthcare systems. Right, right, right. Actually, that is bringing me to a point that I was very curious to know um, that um, how much of this training and knowledge that you provide really lands only in areas and in, in um, specific areas or specific hospitals based on 
whether they are inclined to support breastfeeding in the first place, they are interested in this. So is, is it really just the inclination of a specific hospital or section of the healthcare system that where you are able to bring this knowledge to? Or is there some sort of a centralized incentive that says, no, we need X percent of our staff to be educated across the board. It's not uh, specific to certain areas or certain hospitals. Yeah. So we are different. So we're, you know, relatively small nonprofit, quite honestly. Um, yeah. And what we do is we primarily educate individuals who are going to go out there and start to be, beat the drums in their own system. So we're, so as opposed to, um, there are some organizations that focus on like, you know, baby friendly certification, right? So they're coming to this organization saying, to the hospital organization saying, here's all the things that you need to do to be baby friendly. We haven't gotten there yet um, with health systems. Right now, what we do is we, there, right now, we're one of the only organizations in the world that really focuses on physician education. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a, um, a co-founder of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, which is the first physician organization in the world that's dedicated to uh, breastfeeding, that's physician only. So we started that in 1994. And then I just branched out with this organization in 2014. Um, and uh, just to kind of continue like intensively training physicians in breastfeeding medicine. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, it, it's taken a long time actually to get this taken up. So how, so, you know, when you look at like how baby friendly rolled out, baby friendly rolled out, not because physicians were at hospitals saying that they really want to make these changes, but it, it's been more probably from administrators like hospital administrators and lactation consultants and, you know, anyone who would be on a, like a baby friendly team and try to get buy-in from administration to make the hospital baby friendly. It, for the most part, I mean, there may be some hospitals where it's the physician. I know that the, it is true that sometimes it is the, it was, has been the physician who's been sort of the, the, the drum beater. Um, but, uh, but generally what happens in healthcare in hospitals is that when they decide they're going to be friendly, every provider has to have three hours of training um, who's, you know, works in mother baby unit. And then they just go to the training and they're told, oh, you know what? We're not going to put the babies in the nursery for you to examine them anymore. You're going to have to go into the patient room. Okay. And then, oh, by the way, you know, you're going to delay the clamping. And oh, by the way, you're going to, you're going to put the baby skin to skin on their chest rather than in the warmer. And the doctor's like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing, you know? And so doctors have sort of been like dragged along. But now I feel like we have more and more physicians who are like, stepping up and saying, yeah, yeah, this is the evidence. This is what we need to be doing. We have more physicians who are doing research in breastfeeding medicine. And so this is filtering into that outpatient sector of physicians who are starting, physicians who are being trained in breastfeeding medicine, who are starting breastfeeding medicine clinics for health systems. And so that is a good beginning to then sort of bleed some of that knowledge and support into these other areas, but it does take, um, you know, coordination, right? Like you, like you have to find, like if, like for me, I'm family medicine. So I'm in the department of family medicine and our breastfeeding medicine clinic has been in family medicine. I want support from kids. I want support from, you know, from the breast surgeons, from, you know, pharmacy, from all the different areas in order to make sure that, you know, like my patients aren't going to urgent care within the health system and being told, oh yeah, you have mastitis, you should pump and dump your milk while you take this antibiotic, you know? Like, wait, that's not, you know, it doesn't have to have like one insular breast feeding medicine center when no one in the other, you know, other people are not supporting lactation because, you know, what is a patient to do? They're like, oh, I see Dr. Edlash for breastfeeding medicine, but then I was told to pump and dump by this person in urgent care. Like that's not, right. it doesn't help my, it doesn't help me support that patient, right? That patient is right. that. So, so it's really more like, it's almost more like, this is a terrible analogy, but it's almost more like cancer. Like you start with the nidus and you kind of, kind of like metastasize through the health system to gain that support. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not a metastasis it's more like yeah. here's the structure you got to do it kind of 
yeah. That's your medical background giving you that analogy. <laughs> analogy for me, it's like the spilled milk that just spills everywhere. <laughs> like a little flood throughout the health system. <laughs> That's right. Um, right. And, and do you see that the number of physicians who are interested or um, interested in uh, developing their knowledge in this area is growing? Do you see a tendency for that? Yes, it's yeah. Great. So we do a lot of training for, of physicians and we have an increased number. So the more so it's kind of it, 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 I think what we'll see is that it'll become exponential over time um, for a couple of reasons. Number one is that it's become very clear that well, we've known for a long time that people who are more highly educated, who are a little bit older, who have more money, are more likely to breastfeed, right? Um, and so these, this is that's what describes a medical student and a resident. So these are young people who are in their training, and then they know they're going to breastfeed, and then they realize, like, I didn't learn anything. So they're motivated to learn not only to help their patients, but to actually help themselves So when they have their first baby. So that's one plus. But then the other thing is that by having, uh, like when I look at communities where there are physicians like myself who have been doing breastfeeding medicine for a long time, there are more physician, like lactation certified physicians in those communities than others, because like, you know, there are so many physicians who spend time with me who want to do what I do, but they go on and, and, and uh, pursue that education and get that credentialing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's where, you know, we just will spawn more people where we are. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. And I, and I also see, saw on your website that you have um, a great amount of a variety of training books, handouts, videos. You have the podcast about breastfeeding medicine that really gives excellent resources for healthcare professionals to educate themselves about breastfeeding or I suppose to also to initiate the interest in like, oh, this is something that I really need to get more involved with. Um, I wanted to talk with you about your outpatient breastfeeding champion course. It's a 16 hour course. Um, it is obviously not a lactation consultant training. It's more like creating enough knowledge to serve as a bridge Yes, the lactation consultant care for mothers who need it or recognizing things like you just mentioned about the reception saying, oh, you're breastfeeding, would you like water or something that it's like um, enough knowledge to know where to direct that person uh, for more support if needed. Or often what I noted, noticed is that um, sometimes even the problem might not manifest for the mom as a problem she might just think oh my my breastfeeding journey just came to a natural end my milk supply went down but if she so she doesn't think of it as a problem so she doesn't uh, think of looking for help for it but maybe somebody who is trained in some basic level of of lactation would recognize signs of like oh these are actual issues that easily could be um helped by a professional like a lactation consultant so um, about this breastfeeding champion course, how do you see it? Um, does the presence of breastfeeding champions make a difference in mothers breastfeeding longer? Do you see continued breastfeeding where without a champion, some of these mothers who are facing challenges would fall through the cracks? Um, do you see that impact? Yeah, yeah. So just a little history of the course. So uh, this actually emerged out of the University of Wisconsin. So back in about 2012, we had an issue with not having enough support in our community for people just to answer the most commonly asked questions. So um, I along I got I received a grant um, through from an insurance company um, at, here at the university, and um, it was the idea was to train office nurses to properly triage phone calls. And mm -hmm. so it so over the course of, of a year, I realized you know you can't just teach nurses to triage these phone calls with just two or three hours of training. Like there's a minimum amount of education that people need to be answering questions using evidence-based medicine. And that came out to like no more than 14.5 14, 14 hours. And then it ends up being 16 because of some breaks in between, right? So, um, so what we have found, we have a couple um, articles, one article that's gonna be published soon about the effectiveness of the program. Um, we have found that, uh, we've, so we've had, 
breastfeeding champion nurses who are like the they're the office nurses who do the phone calls who actually also go into the well baby exams when a family's in the clinic, you know, to be seen for like a two or four month, a uh, three or four month exam, the nurses will go in and answer questions about going back to work or about a drop in milk production, et cetera. And so what we have found so far with our research is that there's a much higher level of self-efficacy um, and uh, more a sense of power or control over being able to give this knowledge to families. We still have not been able to prove that um, providing this, that actually training these specific nurses with our particular curriculum increases breastfeeding rates. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know from like a, there was a really good study that was just published um, just this, just like a week ago that was done in, I think it was in Pennsylvania where they actually asked people, do you have a person who you can always call with questions? And if they said yes, they, they had higher bus renew rates than people who said, no, I never really had that person. So the idea is that the way we have it set up at the University of Wisconsin is that everyone who belong, who's a who's a patient at that clinic knows who the breastfeeding champion is, and they can call that person and talk and ask questions at any time. And then the breastfeeding champion, um, you know, who has just that limited amount of education, can reach out to us in the breastfeeding medicine clinic if they have questions. Um, especially like not knowing, okay, you know, we know that this patient should see you in the clinic, but what can I do in the meantime? Here, here's what I tried already. And then ultimately, you know, the, the ideal would be to gradually grow their knowledge over time. And that's something that we were doing at the University of Wisconsin, where I was doing in-services with them to fill in all the things that they didn't learn. Like, you know, when is it appropriate for a breastfeeding baby who refuses a bottle to see speech therapy? Um, when, uh, what are the first steps in inducing lactation, uh, et cetera. And so uh, there's so much to learn, right? And so then the pandemic hit and uh, now we're just starting to get back into revamping that whole program to um, further the education among the breastfeeding champions. But we've had breastfeeding champions who've been doing this work now for about 10 years at the UW and, and they love what they do. And um, I've heard several nurses over the years say that they would like to, be trained because they here's the thing Eva so they're answering the questions anyway mm -hmm. someone's calling and saying my milk smells it's funny what should I do and if and so it's not like nurses can avoid breastfeeding questions right mm -hmm. so they may say oh if it smells if it smells bad you should probably dump it well we know that they shouldn't be dumping it right because it's all milk smells when it comes out of the breast and goes into a bottle and stores in the refrigerator mm -hmm. um and so um it's really a matter of like giving it's not like people aren't going to get their questions answered. They're just not going to get their questions answered appropriately. So this course, actually, what we have done with the course is we have made it a train their trainer program. So we've had um, lactation consultants and doctors from many health systems around the country take this curriculum back to their healthcare system and train their office nurses and medical assistants. And then it's also used, uh, it's been used widely in many uh, WIC offices. I don't know if you know what WIC is. Yes. Uh, yeah. So there are many book offices, particularly in the Midwest region of the United States, where they've been using this curriculum for their staff. And the difference between this and something that's like a like a one week course where you become like a, you know, like one of these 45 hour courses is that this is really more like rubber to the road. Someone says to you, I have low milk production. How can you support them? So we have a, we teach them a triage. Here's all the questions you ask. If they answer yes to these, here's some things they can do in the meantime, and then until they see the lactation. So they, they're not, we're not turning them into lactation consultants, but it gives them something to say and do that's evidence-based that's really going to be supportive um, before they actually are seen for more help. And for many people, it's it's all they need. They just need to know, you know, oh, okay, um, my baby. So for example, we teach people. Um, someone calls on the phone and says, you know, my baby is, you know, two weeks is uh, three weeks old. The baby was seen at two weeks uh, for their well child visit. Baby was gaining fine. Now at three weeks, I feel like the baby's only nursing for five minutes on one side and then the scene's done. I don't know what to think about that. So the breastfeeding champion is trained to say, come on in, let's weigh that baby. Let's take a look. And the breastfeeding champion say, wow, your baby gained, you know, um, like, you know, 300 grams in the last seven days, you know, mm -hmm. that's great. 
And so you're doing great. And so you have high milk production and your baby's like a super amazing vacuum and can take that milk in five minutes, hurrah. And it gives them, and so understanding not only like what can be their scope of practice, but also recognizing that that single step of having them come in and weighing the baby without having to see another health professional and not pathologizing the whole situation can be amazingly supportive, right? Um, and uh, can make make or break, you know, whether or not someone's going to continue to breastfeed because they're worried. So, um, you know, so what we teach really is that there are a lot of things that are normal, right? That happen to lactating families and, and parents are trying to figure out their kids. They're trying to understand like, is it normal for my baby to do this? And, and then translating that baby's behavior, like, like are they understanding the feeding cues? Are they understanding the baby's behavior? And then getting that reassurance by weighing the baby. Like, yep, yeah, you're feeding the baby exactly how often you should be. But then if the baby's not getting, you're like, hmm, let's send you to lactation, let's send you to the doctor. But in the meantime, you need to give the baby, you know, let's, you know, have you whatever, you know, whatever the recommendation is. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about some options here to give this baby more calories. Um, so yeah, so we, so it's all about that bridge and that safety. It's creating a safety net. Um, yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Yeah. Like half of it is knowledge. Half of it is the fact of reassurance that, that somebody understands to some extent what you're going through, what you're experiencing, and then is able to direct you to the right person right. to, yeah. to see for further help. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that's, it's yeah. very good. It's very interesting. And again, I'm, I am so intrigued and I love the fact that it's focusing on the healthcare system is focusing on, on medical professionals, because that's where I feel as well that there is a, there is a there is definitely a slow pickup there, or or we didn't see enough support, and and especially with physicians, as you say, like in my mind, if there is a breastfeeding um family, every time they show up at the physician, the first question of the physician should be how's breastfeeding going, you know, like without no matter what other problem or what other issue they are with, even if it's about a sore throat or I don't know, ask that question anyway. <laughs> Right, exactly. because there might be some issues coming up that you haven't thought of before, or they are not obvious just by examining the baby, but they they do matter and they do somehow uh, Im impact the situation. Right, and I think the other thing that's important to realize is that we are healthcare teams, right? So when we talk about like, oh, physicians they're not getting trained in breastfeeding, they don't know enough. Well, in the United States, guess who's answering the phone? It's the nurse or it's the medical assistant or it's the receptionist who maybe have a little bit of medical assistant training. And that's where they're getting a lot of their advice, right? Not directly from the physician. So physicians yeah. need to absolutely know what they're doing. There's no question, but it doesn't make sense for there to be a trained physician who's now go about breastfeeding and then have a nurse who's answering the phone, a phone call saying, you know, someone asks them, can I take, you know, can I take, uh, you know, ibuprofen while I'm breastfeeding and the nurse or the and medical assistant says, I don't know, let me ask the doctor. And then the doctor is ending up with a hundred million questions. I mean, that's ridiculous. They, everyone should work to the, to, to their highest level of scope of practice in terms of supporting lactation. And that's real. Yeah. Approach. And physicians are going to be much better at supporting if they know if their staff is supportive. And that's the whole idea with the breastfeeding champion program. Mm, fantastic. Well, and thank you so much for your time. That was very nice to hear about the organization and I'm really rooting for this to, to spread. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for 